narrow. We're talking about something more broad, more diverse, gospel-centered mission. We might call it gospel-centered ministry outreach to get, to get the idea of the scope of it. It spans a, a scope from everything of evangelism, just sharing the, the gospel message with your neighbor or classmate or coworker, to mercy ministry, helping someone who has need for food or for housing. It's, it's a wide scope. According to all of our different circumstances and giftings, of course, every Christian, not just particular ones, every Christian and the whole church is to be engaged in gospel-centered mission, gospel-centered outreach of some sort. We're sent here as Christ followers to glorify God as we love our neighbors according to their particular needs, all with the aim that they be pointed back towards the God who gave, who gave himself to save and who gives of his resources to heal and help so that people would come to find their joy in Jesus. That's what we're about. That's the first thing kind of behind this message this morning, this process related to church vision that we've been working on. But the other factor is a book that I've been reading. First loaned to me by someone in the congregation, and then a copy of the book was actually mailed to me by another church as a very kind gift. Dane Ortland's new book, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers, that's the title of the book, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. It's, it's, it's a simple read with what I have found to be a deeply encouraging main point. You hear it in the title. Christ's heart for people like us, for plain old ordinary sinners and sufferers, is what? What's his heart? His heart is gentle and lowly. This is the heart of the original New Covenant minister, the original person who embar embarked on gospel-centered mission. And that's what we all, ever since we first came to him, that's what we find in him for us day after day after day. And it's the kind of heart that he wants to form in us for the sake of others as we engage in gospel center mission ourselves. So those are the two concepts that are kind of bouncing around in my head as I come to this topic this morning, the heart behind New Covenant Ministry. Look at a couple different passages. I could have picked several, but I'm going to go to the Gospel of Matthew and look at one at the end of Matthew 9 and one at the end of Matthew 11. So let me read the two of them before making an observation, a point from each passage. So this is first Matthew 9. I read from the very end of both chapters. 9, beginning in verse 32. And as they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him, and when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's from the end of Matthew 9 and from the end of chapter 11, beginning in verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Two passages, I'm going to make two points, one from each, the first one beginning in Matthew 11. So here's the first observation, which is the title of Ortland's book and a quote from Jesus in chapter 11, talking about heart attitude. Here's the first point. The heart attitude of Jesus, love, is, love that is gentle 
and lowly. The heart attitude, love that is gentle and lowly. Matthew 11, if you, if you move up just a little before the part that I read, and look at verse 25, you realize Jesus starts out the paragraph praying. He's thanking God the Father who has hidden these things. He's talking about important spiritual truths, eternal important things that God has hidden from those who are wise and understanding, or at least those who think themselves wise and understanding. He's talking about an attitude here, an arrogant, self-confident attitude that, that he is speaking about and opposing. He's making very clear that both God the Father and God the Son want nothing to do with such an independent, I got it, I know, I'm okay sort of approach to life. He's chosen not to reveal his spiritual truth to such ones. But on the other hand, he does do that for little children, it says. And again, that's also a comment about attitude. People who are not arrogant, but like little kids, are unassuming, realizing that they need. They are intimately and innately dependent because there's just so much that's beyond them. Verse 26 says that. That's the kind of person that God wants to reveal his truth to, and then 27 essentially repeats the idea. The Father and the Son are unknown. We do not start off knowing God. Unknown until and except when God chooses to reveal the truth. And that's important background information to the main point we're going to be making this morning. That's not the main point, but it's important background information because it sets a context that's going to keep us from making a mistake. What we're going to look at, our our main point this morning, we're going to see Jesus presenting himself in in a light. He presents himself in a way that is really hard to believe. But if you do begin to believe it, then it's really easy to distort. It's really easy to, if you can begin to just perhaps get your mind around what Jesus said, to then turn him into some squishy and spineless helper who is at our whim. That's not true. And the context for Jesus' words sets the, sets, sets the picture, paints the whole picture of Jesus and makes some things really clear. If you go back a little further up into verses 20 and following, you see him pronounce woe. That's a word of judgment against unrepentant cities and peoples. And then what we just saw, he, he says, I choose to reveal myself. And I choose who to reveal myself to. And I have nothing to do with people who are arrogant and who are, who are themselves sufficient, who are not going to be dependent, who are not going to approach me like a child. I want nothing to do with that, so I remain hidden from them. This is the God who is sovereign and in charge and the judge of all the earth. That's Jesus, God the Son, and God the Father. That, that's God. And that's the important context that, that prepares us to then hear something that he says, which is just remarkable. So we got to be really clear that this is God who reigns. This is God who is the judge. This is God who wants something to do with arrogance. This is God who demands simple childlike dependence. And now the point. Verse 28. What invites simple childlike dependence? Not the threat of or else just think about this if you spent any amount of time around little kids you get this little kids little children how do you get a little one to bounce over to you and plop into your lap and take his or her hand and play with your nose and pull on your eyelashes and run their fingers through your whiskers and say, scratchy, and giggle. How do you get that? That, that child, the, a two-year-old, to be that, just that childlike, that personable, that intimate, how do you get that? And be sure of it. That's what God wants with us. That is what God wants with us. Little children 
are often used as an example on purpose. Sometimes literally little kids, and at other times childlike terminology. Because, it's on purpose, because how they relate to a loving and trusted parent, how they relate to good dads, for instance, is how God wants to relate to us. And so he, he holds them up as example number one, like this. That's how I want to be with you. It's how he wants us, which is maybe a little bit awkward for some of us. At different times in my life, I, you talk about love or you, even sometimes... Some of the songs that are, that are deeply appreciated in Christian circles just kind of make me just kind of, uh, because they're just too fluffy. I appreciated one of the lines in the song today that talked about the, in the context of the love of God that is strong enough to break sin. That maybe that helps you think about love. It's not all the giggling, running the fingers through the whiskers sort of. Maybe that makes you feel awkward, but... God wants his people. He wants us to relate to him like kids, like little ones who, who have no filter, who have no reticence, who have no suspicion. They don't, they don't look at, a two-year-old doesn't look at mom and dad and think, what's your angle? What are you trying to use me for? What are you manipulating me into? Kid, they just run over and they plop down. No filter. Trusted connection. That's what he wants with us. So how do you get that? Not with the deep voiced roar, get over here into my lap right now or else you'll be sorry. That doesn't work. You might get the kid into your lap. But there won't be any giggling. What do you have to do to get him to bounce over with giggles? Well, somehow you have to communicate welcoming, approachable, desirable, good love. Somehow, different for every kid, different for every parent, different in every relationship, but somehow you got to communicate. When I want you to come over here, and what you're going to find here is something sweet, desirable, good, approachable love. And that's what Jesus does. Verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a wide open invitation. He's not praying anymore. He's speaking to people Wide open call to all. Now yes, remembering the context, we will eventually discover that there are some, that some were those he was talking about up above, who are wise and understanding, who are unrepentant, who want nothing to do with him. They won't turn, they won't repent, they won't come. That's how we'll know. And we will find that there are some that he revealed himself to, that he, he chose to open up their eyes We'll see that too. How will we know? Because they'll be sitting in his lap, so to speak. But that, we, we will observe all that in retrospect. At the end, we'll see the division of people. On the front end, the invitation is to all who labor, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden. Not just some, all. Jesus, so to speak, speaks to everyone. Are you laboring, weary, and heavy laden? Is that you? And the one who says, nope, I got it. I want nothing to do with you. I am wise, understanding. I know a better way. I've got a better plan. I see a better alternative. Okay, have it your way for now. Are you, is it you? Are you weary and laboring and heavy laden? Are you weighed down and burdened and overwhelmed? Are you lost and suffering? If that's you, come to me. You'll find something sweet. I will give you rest. That's his offer. 
Though it may not seem like it right off because he immediately then mentions a yoke, which is about work. A yoke is a device placed around the neck of a farm animal, usually to fasten it to something that it's going to pull, often in a team of two or more. And sometimes there'd be an, an older one and a younger one, or an experienced one and an inexperienced one to teach, to teach how this goes, to teach how we walk, to teach how we work, and the younger would learn from the older. And what Jesus is saying here in this analogy is, come and let me harness you up to walk with me for the work of life. Learn from me. We, we might say, as a disciple of Jesus, as a learner, follower of Jesus, harnessed to him. And that doesn't sound like rest, perhaps, to the one who's laboring and heavy laden. It sounds like more work. Well, keep reading. Jesus means that you will find rest yoked with me for, because, I am gentle and lowly in heart. So you will, for sure, find rest for your soul. need to hold on that verse. That, this is the point right here. As Ortland points out in his book, this is the only place in the Gospels where Jesus describes his heart. It's not the only place where we see Jesus emoting in some way. We, we see him sad. We see him angry. We, we, we see emotions, but this is not a statement about emotion. You talk about heart. It's not a statement about emotion. It's a statement about being, about nature. Biblically speaking, the heart is the core of a person's self. It's, it's who, we, who we are. So what Jesus is getting at here, and this is the only place where it becomes very special and, and important, he's saying, come here with a childlike dependence, bounce on over here and you will find rest. I, I mean it, you will. When you attach yourself, when you get yoked to me, you're going to find rest because what you're going to find is that me, the one you'll be fastened to and walking with at the core of who I am is love that is humble, that is gentle and lowly, that is good. He's meek. These words mean that he's unassuming, he's unpretentious. They describe someone who has not let his success or his status go to his head who does not stand upon his right to be regarded highly, which is highly surprising given who he is. He is God. God the Son. God through whom everything that exists was made. God for whom everything that exists was made. For him. Not just through him, but for him. It all exists for him. We all exist for him. He's the God who made it all. He's the God who's going to judge it all. If anyone had the right to be regarded highly, it's him. But what he says is, no, at the, at the core of who I am is someone who is lowly. You're going to find me to be easily approachable, welcoming and open-armed like any good dad. He's inviting his kids to come to him by telling him, by, by showing, by displaying in some way that we can get. This is who I am at my core, and what you'll find when you get here close to me, tight with me, is something sweet and good. You will find me to be personable and welcoming and kind and gracious. And he says that as he, so to speak, stoops to our level and sits on the floor and opens up his arms and invites us and speaks in words that we can understand and smiles and plays and connects. He is the God of the universe who is near and lowly and full of love for you. That is easy to say and impossible to believe. But it's true. That's what you'll find Almighty God the Son to be like with you if you come and He's luring you to come by telling you that. This is his heart, his promise. That's him. You'll get yoked to him for life, which sounds like work. Yep, but what you'll find fastened to him is that, that this is the one that you're walking with. You're, you're walking through life, to mix the metaphors here, walking through life, cuddled up in the lap of the Almighty who loves you. And the pulling of the yoke, it's his power that's doing it. 
He's much bigger, much more experienced, much stronger. He's actually towing the yoke and you along with him. Actually, his yoke is easy and the burden is light. All you who are laboring and heavy laden, who are weary and worn out, come to me and you'll find rest. You'll find as you walk with me that I am an open-armed lover of your soul. I am the God who is for people. This is an invitation that is precious reality and hard to believe because ever since the garden, there has been one deeply invested in us not believing it. The evil one from the very beginning and ever since constantly is trying to convince us and our hearts are just kind of prone to wonder. I don't know if he's actually that good. Uh, See, I'm not actually a little kid and I've seen people work situations. I know that sometimes it pays to be a little suspicious and a little reserved and a little cautious. And so I, if it sounds too good to be true, that's because it's not true, right? Well, someone wants you to believe that. And something in your heart kind of is prone to wander towards it. We, th- we tend to think the... the the, the offer on the front end is, is nice. It's, it's, it's a loss leader. He's going he's gonna to open up his arms and welcome us in so he can fasten us. And as soon as that yoke goes click, then we've lost it and we're enslaved. Well, something here, something from Jesus, something says like this. And something in us says like this. And there's a little voice whispering in your ears, don't trust that. (laughs) The world's got a lot better offers for you. Which way do you go? Which is true? What does the cross say? See, we we live in, in a sweet spot. We live after the cross. And how kind it is of God to not leave it a he said, she said, or a he said, he said. But to in the middle of the he said, he said to say, well, let me show you something. The almighty God who says he is gentle and lowly in heart humbled himself to become a man, to become a servant, to get hung on a cross naked, nailed up there, pierced in his side, and killed. So which is true? That actually happened. That's not somebody saying it happened. That actually happened. Which is true? The the cross is such such a, a good and kind help to us because not only does the cross actually do something supernaturally. There is spiritual work accomplished by the cross as we are broken free from enslavement to sin. But it's also just an event that is helpful evidence. It, it kind of settles that he said, he said, is Jesus humble and lowly or not? Well, look at him hanging on the cross and answer the question. As we're going to see in the next passage we look at, this is one who walks around with divine power at his fingertips healing people, casting out demons. The cross did not defeat him because he wasn't strong enough. The cross defeated him because he laid down his life, humble and lowly, doing everything, including dying, that we might live, doing everything needed to heal our souls and create communion with us again. That's the evidence that his invitation is right and our suspicious hearts are wrong. And the whisper in your ear is deception. The attitude of the heart of God, as remarkable as it is, as difficult as it is to believe it, is one of gentle and lowly love. He is the God for people.
That's his invitation to us. Come to me. That's his new covenant invitation as he is the first new covenant minister saying, come to me. The cross makes it possible to come to me. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. You will find rest for your souls because you'll find me. That's what he's like. That's what he's like for us. Now, the reason that I'm talking about this this morning is that I'm actually thinking about one click further than that. So what do you think we should be like if we are new covenant ministers following him? What would be fitting attitudes in us? Likewise, gentle and lowly. What does that look like? That takes us to the second point. All that moves us to the second point, which is from the other chapter, chapter 9. So this builds on the first, or perhaps I might say extends naturally out of it, because if the first one was about the heart attitude, this is about the heart active, the heart in action. What it does. So the heart active, moving towards the laboring and heavy laden with the love and truth of Christ. The heart active is moving towards the laboring, the weary, the heavy laden with the love and truth of Christ. And we could look at just any number of places in in the Gospels, which itself is an important note because the kind of things that we see here, read about here, are not unique to here. They're, They're everywhere because this was constantly what Jesus was like, which is worth noting. Constantly. So we've only got one place that talks about his heart, but we've got page after page that talks about that heart in action, what it looks like. But we're going to look at Matthew 9, starting in verse 32. But this is after, if you just glance back at the previous context and move, say, back to verse 18, after Jesus healed a chronically ill woman and raised a dead girl back to life. Think about that. He, raised, he healed a chronically ill woman and raised a dead girl back to life. He then, next passage, healed two blind men, restoring their sight. And as they were walking away, verse 32, behold, a demon-oppressed man who could not speak was brought to Jesus. Now, many sicknesses and afflictions are the result of what we might call natural means, whether it's germs or viruses or birth defects or genetics, something like that. And And a bunch of these things are just natural means. But some of them, the Bible's clear, some, but not all, but some, come from demon oppression like this mute man who could not speak. So Jesus here in this situation is face to face with a demonic. Demon oppression that has afflicted this man. And the power struggle is so matter of fact that it's not even described. Verse 33 And when the demon had been cast out, because of course he is going to get cast out because this is Jesus. When the demon had been cast out, he could speak and the crowds marveled and the Pharisees falsely accused him. Jesus, though, pointed out it was false. As he elsewhere says, the demonic does not destroy the demonic. This is, that makes no sense. This is evidence that the divine power of God is being poured out through Jesus. But that's not our point this morning. The point in looking back at all that is just to to help us look back and set the context here. A dead girl and a chronically ill woman, two blind men, and then a demonically oppressed mute man, all faced and properly restored. That's a pretty decent day's work. That all happened in one day. And then Jesus just repeats it and repeats it. Verse 35, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. We might say that he's ministering the word of God, explaining what God requires, explaining God's law, showing what what it means to to be the holy God, and then showing then our, in contrast, our falling short of that, our failure of it. And then as he brings out 
proclaiming the gospel, what he's doing then is showing what God, the good news of what God has done to, to meet the problem of us falling short of what God demands. God offers a sacrifice to cover the failure of those who trust him. The gospel. Now he, he would have been expressing that in Old Testament terms because the cross hasn't happened yet at this point. But whenever we're talking about gospel, we're talking about new covenant. Jesus' sacrifice to cover over our failings. That's what he's doing. Teaching and proclaiming the gospel. And healing every disease and every affliction. He's going, going, going. This is his life. We get, the, we get the generic statement there, healing everything, and we get the specific examples like the dead girl and the, the woman who was ill and the blind guys. It, it, it's like, like that, day after day after day after day, in town after town and city after city and all the roads in between. He's going because that's his life. Why does he do that? Well, not because he can't get away from it. He's the one going to the towns. He's initiating it. And not because he's just obedient. He's been told to and he has to, though he is that. Notice there's a connection here to his heart. Verse 36 then. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Some of us are probably familiar with the background of that word compassion. It comes from the, the word in the original, comes from one's innards, from your guts. So the idea behind compassion, something disturbing, unsettling deep within. We probably would say something like heartache today rather than something about our guts, heartache. But the point is that something is gripping and moving in a mmm, mmm, mmm sort of way. It pained him to see the people. The people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The people of town after town and in every city, some sick, some blind, some oppressed by demons, some confused and run ragged by the world, some dying and some in anguish because of all that. And all of that, all that physical malady, all that is true, and it's all intended to show us, metaphorically, a picture of what's also true spiritually. Spiritually sick and spiritually blind and spiritually lost and spiritually dying. Jesus looks out at the world in town after town and city after city, that is weary and heavy laden, vulnerable and misled and lost and perishing. Like sheep, they cannot find their way home. And like sheep, they cannot find their way to food and drink that would nurture their souls. Like sheep, they cannot lift a finger to protect themselves. So they are vulnerable and attacked and afflicted. And they are shepherdless sheep. There is no one else to come in alongside of them to help. They are sheep by themselves, wandering, weary, and lost. Mm. Says Jesus. In his gut, his heart aches over that. Because he's the God of people. At his core, he is loving and gentle and lowly, open-armed and welcoming, and wants people to sit in his lap and cuddle with him and play with his whiskers and giggle. And instead, he looks out and sees them perishing. Mm. These who are made in God's precious image and are being destroyed physically and spiritually. And he cannot sit by and happily let that happen. So he moves towards it. Towards every town and every city. All of them. 
teaching and healing constantly and indiscriminately all diseases and all afflictions, not just healing those that he knew would respond to him and would listen. If you think about the context from chapter 11, we know that there are some who will and some who won't. And Jesus does not first discern which one are you, does not look ahead and realize they will respond to me positively. He doesn't do any of that, though he knows who his sheep are. He knows. But he heals all of it. Indiscriminately. Historically, we know that most of these people wanted nothing to do with him. And he healed them anyway. Because he's looking at a person made in the image of God and is grieved by it. All diseases and all afflictions, as he teaches and as he proclaims the gospel, this is the full scope of gospel centered mission right here in the life of Jesus. As he evangelizes people and deals with them in mercy ministry capacities, the whole thing, neatly captured in verse 35, clearly driven by the heart of verse 36, the heart attitude that we've already seen. When active, that heart moves towards people in gospel-centered mission. Now, we're all going to be a little different. We're all going to do it in different ways, depending on our different giftings and circumstances, for sure, for sure. But it will be a part of all of us if we are his, if we are followers of him, because after all, we're yoked to him, and that's where he's towing us. Towards others. In case that's not clear, verses 37 and 38, which then chapter 10 is kind of an illustration of the application of that as the disciples, the apostles are then sent out. Verses 37 and 38, Jesus saw and felt all that he did and all that we just discussed, and then he said to his disciples, this is the work of my church, of me, and of me in and through you. That's what he means. That's not literally what he said, but that's the implication of what he did say. He told the disciples, look at the harvest. Look out there. Look. It is big and wide, and the workers are few. Never mind, though. I got this. I'm God. I'll take care of it. You just sit back and enjoy what I've already done for you. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. It's not either or. It's, and I want you to enjoy what I've done for you with me as we go into this. This is the work of my church, of me, and of me in and through you. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So picture this massive, ripe field and a little work crew harvesting as they move through it. Picking things, putting in the basket, picking things, putting in the basket, and they stand up and say, Whoa, we're going to need some help. They're not supposed to put down the basket and go find people themselves. They're supposed to ask the guy who owns the farm. Of course, it's your field. Will you send more laborers into your harvest field? That's what they do. That's what we're praying. Pray that he'll send more laborers. And asking God to send, really there's a little bit of oomph in that word there. It's not asking them, him to invite. It's asking him to send. To push people into the field. To thrust them out into the field. Pray that God will do that. Pray because he must do that. We can't preach it so I can't preach it so. We can't recruit it. We can't make a cool video, cast some compelling new vision and mission for the church, coin a catchy phrase and and print it in a, a, a modern captivating font and get just the right color mix and put it on the right brochures and now we got it. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. We can't recruit. We can't preach it. 
But we can pray and ask God to do it, to do what is needed. And what's needed, follow this, is to create in us the heart attitude of Jesus that drove him into town after town and city after city. The heart attitude of Jesus that drove him into the lives of weary and heavy laden people. God must make that sort of heart beat in our chests too. So pray for it. For you, for me, for all of us, that's a key component of gospel-centered new covenant ministry. A heart that sees people like this. And I think that sometimes when I, I begin to, to walk down that path a little bit, me sometimes and maybe others of us sometimes who are very keenly aware of and focused on our need for a God-centered vision of life, which I am keenly aware of and keenly focused on and totally in agreement with, a God-centered vision of life. Sometimes people like me, maybe like some of us here, we sort of waver on this idea that I'm talking about he must create a heart in us that feels this for people. And it's concern for people. That's what drives us forward. Is that not a man-centered vision of life? Hmm. Not sure. Well, I don't know. Let's look at verse 36 again. Maybe Jesus is man-centered. If he is, then we should be too. Of course he isn't. He's appropriately God-centered and because he's God-centered, the heart of God actually does care about people. So because he's God-centered, he's man-centered. Both. Because he's God-centered, he's man-centered. Because we're God-centered, we must be man-centered. If that doesn't make any sense, well, maybe it's like this. The same center. To love God and love people is the same center. So we need to be about this that Jesus is about and pray for this heart to be formed in us and maybe pray against the heart, be alert to it and watch it that I think probably a heart that comes easier to us is a heart that when we see the people of the world and the ways that they wander, rather than grieved, is more irritated angered, even a bit afraid, because they're messing everything up. And they are. We're helping. We're helping because we're still fallen sinful people ourselves. But the vision that the world has for the world is wrong. It is. And when we see that, it's, we don't have to play any games with that and say, like, oh, that'd be fine, that's okay, that, that's great. But let's, let's circle back again. Jesus was well aware that everybody that he's talking to has an, another idea. That's part of the problem that grieves him, that moves him towards them. He has complete confidence. We can too. He has complete confidence that it works out in the end. It does. So we don't need to be angry or irritated or combative, defensive. But instead, like him, we can love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and turn the other cheek when they strike us. And when they demand we carry their cloak, we offer to do it for a second mile. We can do that in his power, following in his footsteps. But for that, we must pray, pray, pray for the Lord of the harvest to form that kind of heart in us. To give us first a fresh experience of the loving and gentle, lowly heart of Jesus for us. For us. And then to form that same sort of heart in us for the sake of gospel-centered mission to others. That laboring, weary, 
heavy laden, lost people might come to find rest for their souls and joy in Jesus like we have by the grace of God alone. That's the heart behind new covenant ministry, what we should pray for our church to grow in and for God to build in us. So let me do that right now. Join with me in prayer. Father, would you please, uh, I'll say first for me, would you please forgive me and maybe us when we are more angry with the world than compassionate towards it? Will you forgive us, me, where I am more focused on myself than others? Well, that's, that's a reality for me and for us. Will you form in us a heart like that of Christ's, who was full of love that is gentle and lowly, that is for people, is not pretentious, but is moved with compassion when others are hurting, moved towards them. Make, make that happen, Lord. We, we can say a lot of words. I can, I can talk about that, but we're praying because we can't make it be. So would you please make that be in me and in us, and shape our church to be useful to you in, in the right way that's right for our church. Every church is different. Every person's different. But you've got something for us. So we, in the way you want to shape us to be used, will you please do that? We, we look to you. We depend on you. We're thankful that you are for us and pray that you would then shape us and use us alongside of you as you seek and save the lost. Thank you, Lord. We trust ourselves to you. Amen.